Usually I'm the kind of person who, if I see a student's paper begin with a phrase such as, uh, since the dawn of time, uh, I've got to admit it makes me cringe. There really are very few things that truly merit such an introduction. But for this lesson, we really are going all the way back to at least the dawn of human experience, so it's gotta count for something, right? So you've decided to take this class, Interactive Multimedia. So one would think that you have an idea of what you're getting yourself into. So let me ask the same stupid question I ask each and every one of these classes at the beginning of the semester. What is multimedia? And usually the response is, well, well, that's a really good question. Or, uh, well, that's why you're here to teach us, professor. Um, fair enough. And um, I'm a bit of a dork to ask about it anyways. So let's go right to it. Etymo etymologically speaking, um, multimedia is made up of multi, meaning many, and media, meaning uh, it's the plural of medium, if you remember your Latin declensions, uh, which means the middle, the, the center, the, the midst, um, uh, or in some cases, community or public. Uh, in English, it came to mean uh, a ways of expressing or communicating, middle ground, common ground, a medium of exchange, something that lies between us. Uh, but when we discuss multimedia today, we're specifically referring to the modern electronic interactive kind, made up of text, images, audio, animation, and video. But before we get there, in order to know where we are, we kind of need to understand where we've been, and that will inform us as to where we're going. So with that in mind, in the beginning, there were rocks. And we still have some of those rocks, such as the Lascaux Caves in France, building block number one, images. These cave paintings are the earliest examples of personal expression that we have, a means by which we can experience the thoughts or intentions of another without actually meeting them. Uh, Computer-mediated communication is kind of a pun if you think about it. Like all human expression that survives to modern day, it's a bit of a time machine. We can see extinct species such as these aurochs, uh, or these, Ursus spelaeus, or the cave bear, also extinct today. Early humans and these critters shared habitat. Neat fact, have you ever looked at the conger, you know, the Big Dipper? And have you ever wondered why in all of those uh, stories and all of those drawings it ha had a long tail? Our modern bears don't have long tails. Cave bears had long tails, and that's likely how far back that particular story goes. In any case, we see that images are worth a thousand words, but they're not necessarily the most articulate of words. I mean, what was the artist here trying to express? Expression of articulate ideas requires some abstraction, and paintings don't really do that very well. You need words. Which brings us to a new medium. Building block number two, writing. What do you think this is? Well, it turns out that this is an ancient Costco receipt. I'm um, sorry, it's a, it's a storage house receipt. Pretty much the same thing, right? You see the pictograms of bread or wheat and the pips next to them? It was a kind of proto-writing. Most early writing was about one or a combination of some three things. Either property, conquest, or religion. Things that early people thought were important. And writing soon was abstracted from visual images into symbols that represented the sounds we made with our mouths. This in turn allowed us to record and articulate speech in a way that was able to stick around. Well, at least for the richer classes. Writing, of course, was an entire uh, vocation reserved for the scribes and the wealthy folk who could employ them. Now, stone lasted throughout the ages. But let's say that you wanted to write a letter to a neighboring king. Well, you'd have to hew out a rock or a piece of clay and write what you wanted to say on it, strap it onto the back of the messenger, and send them off. <coughs> Rocks were heavy, and they were not very portable. So the Egyptians, who had a fine appreciation for all things huge and heavy, invented papyrus a flat material made out of strips of the reed of the same name that grew in the Nile River, and its use spread throughout the ancient world. Here we see a letter from King Darius of Persia. Using papyrus, he could send messages with ease rather than weighing down a servant with rocks. And here he is, Darihush Malka, or Darius the King, in Imperial Aramaic writing. 
In many ways, Papyrus was a huge step forward and a smaller step back, and we'll, we'll see this pattern uh, with every new emerging expressive technology, so keep an eye out for it. But the nature of Papyrus was that it was much more portable, but it was rougher to write on. One had to use new tools, such as reed pens rather than chisels or brushes, and it was fragile. Uh, in order for Papyrus to survive, it needed a dry and cool environment, otherwise it would just simply rot away. And uh, if there's one thing that the ancient Mediterranean wasn't, was dry and cool. To this day, if we were to gather the entire corpus of all rock writing, both surviving and lost, and compare it to the entire corpus of all papyrus writing, both surviving and lost, a larger percentage of rock writing was likely to have survived to present day. It's merely that much more resilient. Uh, still, ink and papyrus was the standard for many, many years for documents, and writing underwent a process of refinement. Such as the use of vellum. Well, what is vellum? Well, essentially it's prepared animal skins. This made writing more expensive than papyrus, but you could be so much more expressive with it. You see that stuff that looks like gold in those drawings? It is. This is an illuminated manuscript, where the pictures illuminate the text and make it beautiful. Or odd. I, I mean, I've never quite figured out what's going on with that guy there. Is he fly fishing? I, I don't know. This is a page from my favorite manuscript, the Book of Kells. What, I can't be so much of a nerd as to have a favorite manuscript? <laughs> anyway, the Book of Kells was a copy of the Four Gospels of the Latin Vulgate, inked somewhere in Britain and Ireland around 800 CE. If you see in the text right there, that big blue illumination is a P, and after it comes, Pater Noster qui es in Calus. Well, that's the Lord's Prayer in Latin. They made an awesome movie called The Secret of Kells, animated in the same way as the manuscript's illuminations. I really can't recommend it highly enough. Anyways, how much work did this text take? Uh, was it done by the average Joe? Well, no, being a scribe was a profession. Uh, the average person still couldn't read because it was not accessible. And the materials were incredibly expensive. I mean, with rare inks and animal skins, often the monks that penned them couldn't afford, them, or couldn't afford the manuscripts themselves. But that didn't stop further innovations such as miniatures, small complex scenes penned among the illuminations. This illuminated letter D is roughly the size of a large postage stamp, and it wasn't confined to Western literary traditions either. Here is an example in Sanskrit. Here is an example in Arabic. Once again, what looks like gold is gold. Can you see the text? It's, it's in there. Because of the nature of Arabic text, it can be written to fill almost any shape. So you have these wonderful examples of arabesques, where the poetry can take on the form of what it describes. In any case, we now land upon our next medium. Building block number three, audio. Text did not very well convey the tone or pitch on top of spoken language. The advent of musical notation allowed songs to be preserved for the very first time. Before then, they had to be passed down from person to person, but now they could be preserved. These manuscripts still took an awful lot of time to write out. And early musical notation did not standardize for some time. On the top left, we have the oldest form of notation from the Cyclos epitaph. Here on the left is Gregorian notation, still used today to write out liturgical chants. And below, we see something more familiar. In fact, you can likely see the name J.S. Bach in the upper right corner of it. This is one of Johann Sebastian Bach's Suites for the Lute in his own handwriting, and this system employed by him and a variety of other contemporary composers, eventually became the standard notation that we're familiar with today. In any case, at this point we still had manuscripts, which had to be planned out and manually inked by hand. But something came along that changed that, and this was the printing press. It would take roughly the same amount of time to ink a manuscript page by hand that it would to set up type for a page. Every letter needed to be placed by hand regardless of whether it was a pen or a piece of type. However, once the type was set, that is to say, typesetting, one could make as many copies as they had ink and paper for, and these copies were considerably cheaper. Now, still not Staples copies or printed home cheap, but 10 to $20 a page, like modern money sort of cheap. Whole books were still pretty expensive, however, and the threshold for owning a book, and thereby disseminating ideas, still dropped considerably. And when production got cheaper, access increased. This is perhaps one of the most influential books on the form of the modern English language, but not too terribly many people know about it. Take a close look. Most folk assume that it's a Bible, and that's a fair guess as the text certainly does look Bible-like, and it's related to the Bible. But this, in fact, 
is an early Book of Common Prayer, the prayer book of the Church of England. Or by its full title, uh, the Book of Common Prayer and Administration of the Sacraments and Other Rites and Ceremonies of the Church according to the use of the Church of England together with the Psalter and Psalms of David pointed as they are to be sung and said in churches and the form and manner of making, ordaining, and consecrating of bishops, priests, and deacons. TLDR, it's the cognate of the Siddur in Jewish tradition and uh, the Divine Office in Catholic tradition uh, or the uh, Salah in Islam. Anyways, these were mass-produced and by law under King Henry, each church had to have one chained to a lectern for the public to access, and because this was the language of the daily prayers, which were previous to Henry exclusively in Latin. In any case, what do you notice about the nature of the printed text? I mean, we have illuminations and such, but what did that music manuscript have that this doesn't, other than the musical notation, of course? Color. Printed materials were two steps forward by increasing access, but one step back with how elegant the final product looked. Although, there were some early attempts to fix that. They, they really weren't that good. This is a later book of common prayer that used a multicolored printing process to write out the musical notation. Two plates had to be prepared, one in red ink to print the staves, and one in black ink on top of it to print the text and the notes. But you'll notice that as you read the notes, they slowly begin to slide down the staves the further down the page you go. Now, this was because the tolerances for printing presses at the time were not fine enough for multicolor printing because everything had to be aligned painstakingly by hand. This made color printing exceedingly expensive. However, any music we see on this page required something important, much like how writing of any sort uh, does in order to be interpreted. Now, in order to enjoy this music, you need someone who can sing it. In modern times, roughly 40 to 50% of people have trouble singing, and a similar number can't play an instrument. So, where do we go from here? Our next game changer, mechanical music. This was a new way to record and playback music, one that did not rely upon a singer's voice or music reading abilities. Small machines that can play the same song by reading pins set into a cylinder, or holes set into a piece of paper, or in a piece of tin. Many of the self-playing instruments sold across America in the late 1800s and early 1900s were made right here in New Jersey. Uh, for example, the Regina Music Box Company, uh, they were situated in Rahway. Uh, 54 Cherry Street was where their factory was back in the day, and now nowadays it's an apartment building. But anyways, these sorts of programmable media allowed machines to read encoded songs and play them back. And some of these machines became incredibly complex. Now, here's a player piano that has a player violin integrated into it as well. And if you want to see an amazing collection of these sorts of machines, I recommend going to the Morris Museum in Morris Township, which houses the famous Guinness Collection, made up of self-playing instruments and automata. It's called the Guinness Collection after Guinness the Beer. Well, stout, actually. Yeah, it's a stout. Anyways, uh, Murtaugh Guinness was the heir to the Guinness fortune. Uh, he was a socialite. Uh, he partied all night, he slept all day, and in his spare time, he collected self-playing instruments and automations. Well, anyways, while ways to store and playback songs became more complicated, we had a number of advances in another brand new medium. Photography. This is the Boulevard du Temple by Louis Daguerre. Where he wasn't the first to develop photography, Daguerre was among the first with his daguerreotype process to make it commercially feasible. This photo in particular is believed to be the first candid photograph ever taken. Can you see who was caught in the frame? Well, there he is. Likely, someone was getting their shoes shined. Who this person was, unfortunately, is lost to time. Taking a photo only took a few moments of time to capture an image. No longer were days of painstaking work painting or carving required to produce a scene. You could literally crystallize an expressed moment in time. And it only took a single year before we had the words first selfie. Uh, Robert Cornelius was an early lamp maker and photographer. I guess the, uh, these were the emo years of the Victorian age. But you note that photography's big step forward was actually capturing a real image. The, the big step back was that it could only capture images in black and white. So sort of like what happened with manuscripts in the printing press, right? Regular ink printing, on the other hand, having much more time to refine itself, was making great strides forward. With this, the three-color printing process. Before, if you wanted to have an image in color, like our example with the prayer book with the red music staff, you had to have a plate
plate with each color printed, and you had to ink each one in the proper hue, and you had to align them all together in order to ensure that they all lined up properly. With the advances in fine machine tolerances, printing techniques, and a newfound understanding of how our eyes perceive color, printers like William Kurtz here realized that, like a painter mixing paints, all you really needed for full color images were three shades, red, yellow, and blue. By the way, <clears throat> spoilers, that's a lie, but we'll learn why as we go over color in a later lesson. Overlaying these three colors in different matrices, one can make some very vivid prints, such as the one here. Now while this was happening, we had some further developments with audio that led to the death of an industry. Recorded audio. Thomas Edison first invented the phonograph or gramophone back in 1877, but it really did not become commercially viable until uh, the very late 1800s and early 1900s. It recorded vibrations in the air onto grooves on a wax cylinder, and when the cylinder was turned and moved the needle, the sound was replayed through the horn, much like how a, a photograph's negative could project its image onto photosensitive paper to make a copy. In the 1890s, a man by the name of Emil Berliner realized that cylinders were bulky, and he also realized that one could use a flat disc with a groove spiraling from the outside edge to the inner hub, and the record player was born. Actually listening to music played by a live human being has a certain emotionality to it that mechanical music of the day couldn't really match. And mechanical music couldn't reproduce the most important instrument of all, that being the human voice. Over the course of the next 20 years, the self-playing music industry completely collapsed, and everyone had an Edison in their homes. Remember the Regina Music Box Company? Well, they changed markets. To vacuum cleaners, specifically. See? Regina Pneumatic Cleaner, manufactured by the Regina Company, Rahway, New Jersey, New York, Chicago, Model A. And, uh, they kept on producing under the Regina name up until very quite recently. Uh, until they were, of course, sold to the Royal Company and were rebranded as Dirt Devil. So, true story! The advent of recorded sound turned one of the biggest manufacturers of music boxes to make vacuum cleaners in order to survive. This is what I mean by a game changer, something that completely changes the playing field. And with such massive change possible, developments began to accelerate. In the mid to late 1800s, where not necessarily new, due to mass manufacturing techniques, we see the rise of these particular toys called zoetropes. These are the best exemplars of building block number four, animation. When viewed through the slits while the carriage spins, the drawings seem to come alive. This early animation takes advantage of persistence of vision, a property of human perception to create the illusion of motion. And this inspired the Lumiere brothers to exploit the same principle in 1895, only taking pictures rather than drawings to create the very first true moving pictures. Building block number five, video, was born. And right in time for the 20th century, all five building blocks had arrived. Text, images, audio, animation, and video. What started to change rapidly, very rapidly, was how we combined them in new and novel ways to express ourselves, and how we produced and consumed these novel forms of expression. We saw our first animated films like Gertie the Dinosaur and Steamboat Willie, which was the first cartoon to add sound. And it wasn't just cartoons either. Sound was added to video, making the transition from silent film to talkies. From the very first talkie, the jazz singer, well, certain scenes haven't aged particularly well. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what you think it is. To even famous silent film actors like Charlie Chaplin making the jump in The Great Dictator. And actually, this isn't likely what you think it is. I'll leave a link nearby. It's more relevant than ever, actually. However, how did you enjoy motion pictures back in the early 1900s? Uh, you would need an entire theater with state-of-the-art equipment. You couldn't enjoy it at home, of course. Uh, that is, until this guy came along. A man by the name of Guglielmo Marconi. And he discovered radio communications. I grew up only a few blocks away from his house that he lived on on Radio Court, like right on the border of New Brunswick and Franklin. Uh, and the site of his laboratory is still on Easton Avenue in Somerset. Lots of fascinating things happened in New Jersey. Now, most people like to attribute radio to uh, this guy. You probably recognize Nikola Tesla. He's trendy these days. 
And he did indeed publish his paper a few months before Marconi published his, so they were both independently working on the problem of radio communication. However, Marconi was the one who actually made it happen. He built a working prototype years before Tesla was able to. This picture is specifically of his wireless telegraph machine that sent the first transcontinental radio signals in the world. So what was the big deal about radio? Well now, you could broadcast information wirelessly. Over a very short amount of time, we saw the advent of radio programs, television, cable, and satellite TV, all based upon Marconi's principles. From your own living room, you could tune into the news or watch Howdy Doody. It was a major advance that caused all sorts of social stirrings. All kinds of media to this point were known as push media. And there was no interactivity. It was all about whatever was on the airwaves or on the cable. At most, you might be able to call into a TV station. In order to have interactivity, we needed a device that had the means to directly interact with us, which could respond to our inputs. What could that possibly be? You needed a machine that could respond to user input. You needed a computer. And not just any computer, you needed a personal computer. Early computers were huge boogers. They took up entire rooms. Here's an Elliott computer that's roughly the size of three or four upright pianos duct taped together. And here is a Strawberry Pi, which is several orders of magnitude more powerful than that Elliott, in front of the same building almost 60 years later. And here they are, side by side. Isn't that incredible? In any case, personal computing took off with these guys. You recognize them? How about now? Hi, I'm a Mac. I'm a PC. These are Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, the folks who put Apple and Microsoft where they are today. Back when they were first plying their trade in this new digital era, we once again found ourselves with a blank canvas upon which we wanted to express ourselves. What resulted was the eventual shoehorning of all the five building blocks into this digital environment. And as you can see, at first it was more like one step forward, five steps back. It was not pretty. And in the late 80s and early 90s, the founding of the interactive CD-ROM was where modern interactive multimedia as we know it was born, combining all the five building blocks and providing an interface with which to interact with what was on the screen, advancing a presentation or game by our inputs and in turn, have the computers react to those inputs. We were now in control. No longer passive, but active. In order to make this happen, we had to learn about developing interfaces, and how humans interacted with those interfaces. And in the early days, the, the formative years of interactive multimedia, things were learned by trial and error. Sometimes rather hodgepodge. So, to illustrate, allow me to introduce you to one of my favorite early interactive CD games that came about in the heyday of this particular form of multimedia. Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Before you could play, you would have to physically go down to a software store and physically buy the CD in a big bulky box. And on the inside, there was a lengthy user manual as well as a bunch of printouts of the London Times. Heaven forbid you lost it too, otherwise good luck solving the mysteries. You had to install the game, which took about 15 minutes, and then run it from DOS. Here's the menu system, with the hokey magnifying glass as a pointer. Now, they thought this was cute, but it was actually a terrible design choice, as it actually magnified what was under it, which made it very unwieldy. But more about design later on in this course. Each volume had three different adventures, all story-driven. This sort of game was made up by a number of video clips where real actors were filmed telling you the non-interactive bits of the story. Full screen video? <laughs> You're silly. That was too processor intensive and took far too much disk space. And then you'd have a number of buttons to click to go from resource to resource, mostly the other characters you could talk to. And there was interactive dialogue where you could ask questions, reveal clues, take notes, etc, etc, and gathering evidence until you had your big j'accuse moment. It was terribly campy and terribly fun, despite all the limitations. But this game, like all other games of its era, were very highly dependent upon removable media and many of the compromises that were made had to do with the fact that you could only store so much information onto a disk. Loading times were terrible. As you will learn in this class, getting multimedia into a digital environment takes up a lot of disk space, 
And the only way that this was possible to do in the 90s was through so-called large format discs like CDs and then later DVDs. But something happened that slowly began to change that. And that was the ability for computers to talk directly to one another, transferring information in situ rather than through removable media. And the early internet looked kind of like this. This is, of course, before the World Wide Web. <laughs> Web pages? Nope, not yet. You had curated, hard-coded pages. Such as this. Some of Prodigy's games. They were a step back as far as interactive multimedia games were. The streaming from the internet, they had to use very little data, but they followed the same sorts of interfaces as their CD counterparts in glorious 16 colors. But soon, internet service providers started branching out from the focused multimedia interface, and the web became a lot more popular, driven by HTML. A system designed to transmit scientific papers, that is to say HTML, HTML web pages, was now being used to transfer all sorts of information in all sorts of formats. And as far as interactive multimedia went, there was one platform that very quickly became the standard. Macromedia Shockwave, uh, better known as uh, Adobe Flash, which as of this year is officially deprecated. Anyways, what Flash gave us was a huge step forward with a little step back. Before, if you wanted to create a multimedia experience, you had to code it all from the ground up by hand. With programs like Flash, one could design it visually and add in the code in the background, which made developing things much, much quicker. Designers could focus on being expressive rather than how many bits or bytes we had to manage. However, about that step back, those bits and bytes do add up. For a multimedia-rich experience, you may have to wait 15 minutes to watch that two-minute-long episode of Homestar Runner, or whatever it was you wanted to watch from Newgrounds, if you could stomach it. So early internet multimedia and CD-ROM multimedia kind of lived in tandem until the advent of broadband. The statement that CDs and DVDs were safe from copying for whoever would be able to store that much information was completely blown away, and things like BitTorrent took their place. CDs were not needed anymore for the rich experience. And now physical media to enjoy our multimedia experiences is quickly dying, replaced by online streaming services. When you want your games, you go to Steam or the online store for your gaming console of choice. You go to YouTube, Netflix, or Prime for your videos or movies. You go to iTunes or Spotify for your music, Kindle for your books. And how we find and share our multimedia experiences changed dramatically as well with the rise of social media. With the click of a button, you could upload and annotate all of your photographs for your friends to enjoy, share that video you took of your vacation, all instantly. And this especially accelerated with the advent of the smartphone. Your average smartphone coalesced the functions of multiple expensive devices into a single, not as expensive device. Before, you'd need a camera, a music player, an audio recorder, and a personal computer. It vastly altered the way that we not only shared content, but how we created it consuming it and making it both in real time. I take a photo or record a video, boom, it's on Facebook. I want to make a meme or an animated GIF, done. We create and consume so much of our multimedia content on our phones and handheld devices that it has become the crucible where much of the focus on things like interface design and new interaction paradigms are being refined. So this is the platform where most of the focus of multimedia professionals at large is these days. So with all that in mind, I have to ask, where will we go next? How will we express ourselves with digital media in the future? I mean, the sky is the limit. And specifically, I want your opinions on this. But for now, let's review. At this point, you should be able to identify and describe the five building blocks of multimedia. You should also be able to relate the basic history of each building block and how they combined into modern digital multimedia. If you're finding yourself in doubt of any of these things, be sure to scrub back over the video and find what you've missed. Beyond that, make sure to take the In the Beginning quiz to check to see what's stuck. And finally, you can always reach out on Canvas with any further questions you have. I'll see you next time.